Good morning. I'm Jennifer Kennedy. I'm the Director of Public Policy and Health Information at Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield. And on behalf of Utah State University and President Stan Albrecht, it's my pleasure to welcome you here this morning for Utah State University's Sunrise Session. Regents is pleased to partner with Utah State University to sponsor these valuable sessions that are designed to educate community leaders on essential um, issues influencing Utah's future. In a few minutes, we're going to hear from Dr. Ron McAllister on the uh, progress and ongoing challenges of careers of professional women, a topic of keen interest to me, <laughs> and therefore the employer that I work for. <laughs> But as a nonprofit um, health insurer, um, Regents knows and understands that women play an important role both professionally and also in large part as the healthcare decision makers uh, for many families. So empowering, empowering those decision makers with information to help make um, health related uh, decisions is very important to us, as well as uh, working with the women that uh, work for our company. I'm very proud, personally, to say that I work for a company that recognizes that, that there are challenges uh, for professional women and, and who works to try and overcome those. So before we hear from Dr. Callister, I want to take a moment and introduce you to, Dr., um, to, to President Stan Albrecht. Uh, Stan is the 15th president of Utah State University, a role in which he has served since 2005. Prior to his appointment as president, he was Dean of the College of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences at USU, and held numerous academic leadership positions at the University of Florida and Brigham Young University. An accomplished sociologist, President Albrecht, had an extensive academic record prior to his move into administration. Since becoming president at Utah State, Stan has had a big impact on the university and the state of Utah. He has led Utah State into its first ever comprehensive fundraising campaign, which has raised over $235 million for new facilities, scholarships, and faculty support. He has overseen the implementation of the U-STAR initiative, which is a partnership of the state's two public research universities, along with government and business leaders, to bring highly productive research to Utah. Moreover, he has had an impact across the entire state of Utah through the enhancement of Utah State's network of regional campuses, making it possible for students to get a Utah State education near their homes in the Uinta Basin, in Tooele, in Brigham City, and virtually anywhere in the world through online learning. Please help me extend a warm welcome to President Albrecht. Jennifer, and uh, thank you, Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield. This has been a wonderful partnership. Uh, Kent, how many times have we done this now? Where is Kent? I think this is our 14th. 14th time, and Regents has been our sponsor from the beginning, and I understand we've just signed up for another year of Sunrise Sessions, and so thank you so much for your generosity. Please join me in thanking Regents. <laughs> And I'm delighted to see such a nice crowd here this morning. Let me uh, offer a special welcome to several members of the Utah State Legislature who are here with us today. And uh, to Dean Doug Anderson. And I think, Dean, you have a number of members of your National Advisory Board here. They'll be meeting all day up at the uh, Huntsman facilities. And so, welcome to you. We appreciate you getting up early and joining us for this, this session this morning. I spent the last day and a half up at Snowbird attending a conference with a number of fellow presidents who are uh, part of a commission for the American Council on Education. And of course, we spent a great deal of time talking about what's happening to the economy and the impact of the economy on what's happening at our institutions, both public and private. But one of the interesting conversations we had, and I'm just mentioning this because I think it highlights the importance of what we do in these sessions, uh, sunrise sessions. One of, the, one of the sessions was uh, looking at what is happening with many of the for-profit institutions that tend to be flourishing at a time that some of the, the publics and, and not-for-profit privates probably struggle a little bit more. And one of the interesting things, and I hope you will understand this, they operate with a totally different model. Their model is really a model of disseminating knowledge. And they've developed a wonderfully effective way of disseminating knowledge doing it at a relatively low cost. 
And yet, as you contrast that with, with our role at places like Utah State University, where our task is not one just of disseminating knowledge, but we're also charged with creating knowledge. And it really is the creation of knowledge that occurs at places like Utah State University that has contributed so much to America's world leadership in so many areas and has contributed so much to the, the discoveries and so impact the quality of life that we all experience. And so if you look at a Utah State University initially established there back in 1888 as part of the great land grant system to not only disseminate but create knowledge initially in the areas of agricultural research but then seeing the expan expansion of that in so many other areas. And I think it's critically important that we understand not just the dissemination process but the creation process because it's going to depend on the continued investment of these great institutions if we are to truly allow America to continue to be the world leader. And so, again, one of the exciting things about these Sunrise Sessions is we get to talk with you not just about disseminating knowledge, but the creation of knowledge. We've been excited to do that. I was glancing back over some of our headings over the last year and a half or so. We've had sessions where we've uh, shared with you genetics research that holds promise for curing obesity and preventing Alzheimer's. We've had presentations on space technology with applications to Utah's high-tech industry. We've had presentations on antiviral research with potential for curing numerous kinds of diseases. Those are the things that set us apart. Those are the things that are so important to us. We're talking today about another form of the creation of knowledge that breaks new ground, that provides, I think, great service to Utah communities. And so I'm delighted today to talk with you just a bit about uh, Dr. Rhonda Callister and to introduce her to you. And I would call your attention, all of you have at your tables uh, a number of copies of a publication that our research office puts out entitled Research Matters. If you would like to carry one of these away, I would encourage you to do so because there's a really nice feature article in here about Dr. Callister and her work. And I think you'll enjoy reading that. <coughs> Before the presentation begins, let me just provide some brief background on Dr. Callister and her work. Rhonda is a professor in the Department of Management in the Huntsman School of Business and is a recipient of the Berlin and Marie Bueller Endowed Professorship. Her areas of research include conflict and anger expressions in organizations, dispute resolution of other cultures, and the impact of gender on careers. Before coming to Utah State University in 1997, she received her PhD in management from the University of Missouri, Columbia. Recently, she was awarded the Women and Gender Research Institute's Distinguished Professor Award. She was recognized in 2001 for a continued mentorship of her numerous research students with the College of Business Teacher of the Year Award. In 2007, she was selected as the College of Business Researcher of the Year. She's written numerous articles for professional journals, given papers at conferences, symposiums, and seminars throughout her research career. And so please join me in recognizing and uh, inviting now to turn our time over to Dr. Callis. Well, today I'm here to talk to you about research that's been done on the careers of professional and academic women. When Sandra Day O'Connor graduated from law school in 1952, right at the top of her class, just behind later Supreme Court Justice William Rehnquist, she was unable to find any law firm in California who would offer her a position as a lawyer. One did offer her a position as a legal secretary. Today, this kind of overt bias would be shocking and illegal. So we have made progress. In fact, women make up 57% of college freshmen. In, and then in professional degrees, we have 52% of the bachelor's and master's degrees in accounting going to women, 47% of the law degrees, 47% of the medical degrees, and 45% of the PhDs in the United States go to women. However, women have not reached the highest levels of these professions in the numbers we'd expect from, from those that start out in the fields. In accounting, 19% of the partners are women, 18% in law firms, 28% of the practicing physicians, 
and 18% of the full professors and academics, the top level there. We used to think that this was a pipeline issue. Women didn't enter the professions in large numbers until the 1970s. And of course, everyone knew it would take a little while for them to reach the top in larger numbers. But it's now been well over 30 years, and you would expect to have seen probably larger changes in the numbers. It's been a very slow process. The numbers have changed very gradually. Part of the challenge is that all male-dominated professions start out with very intense early career periods. Accountants and lawyers work in, put in very long hours. Medical students face grueling residencies. And academics are frantically racing the tenure clock. So the National Science Foundation began looking at their data on sciences, scientists and engineers. And this is what they found. <clears throat> that at the bachelor's degree, there were almost equal numbers of men and women getting bachelor's. Then at the master's and doctorate, it's in the high 30s, close to 40 percent. But when they make the transition to universities, there's a much lower number that become, actually gets a university tenure track position, fewer get become tenured, and then the highest level of full professor at that time was, was around 10 or 12 percent. The National Science Foundation looked at these numbers and were concerned because those numbers were changing so slowly at the high, highest level. And they concluded that the problem was not the women. They were getting high quality research grants, awarding grants to women. They could see lots of high quality in the discipline, in the profession. And they concluded that there may be problems going on at the university level. And they wanted some studies done, some programs developed, some dissemination of what works. How can we do a better job of retaining women faculty in, the, in science, science and engineering? So they developed the NSF Advanced Institutional Transformation Grant. This was a $3 million award funded in 2003 to 2009, and there have since been two other rounds of this award. The purpose of it was to try and improve the re recruitment and advancement of women and minority faculty in the sciences and engineering. NSF considered this a workforce issue. The United States had not been producing the number of scientists and engineers that we needed to meet the demand in the marketplace. And we've been filling in the difference with HB1 visas and, and bringing immigrants into the country to make up the difference. But they figured if they could keep more of the women and minority in the fields of science and engineering that weren't in there in the beginning, but just keep them there, that we might be able to solve the workforce issue. So Utah State University was one of 10 universities out of 78 applicants that received one of these awards to begin looking at what we, the changes we can make at our own university to do a better job of recruiting and advancing women faculty. As part of this grant, we began trying to identify what are the obstacles. And one of the first obstacles we identified is the assumption of the ideal worker that the ideal worker has to be someone that puts their entire effort into being successful, work, willing to do whatever it takes and work as long as necessary. This model started many decades ago at a time when wives stayed home to take care of the home front, leaving the husband and the professional free to put in extremely long hours. However, things have changed. And there are many dual career couples where both the husband and wife want a professional career and they also want a personal life. So with this ideal worker model, which underlies most universities and many organizations, what we find is the common path to success. We see only one third of women who start a tenure track position without children ever have children. 48% of tenured women have no children. Women who are lawyers are less likely to be married, to stay married, or have children. And what this creates is that the path to success is often no children. Now you might say, well, but that's their choice. Maybe they don't want children. 
However, a large study, including the entire University of California system, found when they asked tenured faculty over 40 if they wanted children, 40% of the tenured women and 20% of the tenured men said they had fewer children than they had wanted to have. Their career, in many cases, was just too intense to allow them to fully make the choices that they want, the personal choices they wanted to make. We propose an alternative to allow every person to make the maximum contribution to society and still have a personal life. The next obstacle to success we refer to as opting out versus being pushed out. There have been a number of high profile articles in the media about highly educated, fast track women opting out of their careers to stay home to raise children. And it implies that it's fully their choice and that's what they want. However, follow up interviews with these same women when they're asked, would you have liked to have kept your career but worked shorter hours? And they said, of course, that's what I really wanted. But the, I didn't have that choice. My choice was killer, hour, killer hours or not at all. And what they were looking for is a way of having some flexibility that would allow them to do both. Women who leave professional positions typically plan to take a break for a few years and then go back. The problem is getting hired again. In accounting, 93% of the women who left for two, two years or less had great difficulty returning. Only 40% were able to get another full-time job. Of those 40% that did get full-time jobs back in their profession, they took an average of an 18% pay cut. They'd somehow become less qualified by taking a short break. Next, we also see challenging workplace cultures. Of these women that took a sh short break and try the 93 percent that tried to go back again, less than 5 percent of them wanted to go back to the same firm they worked for before, suggesting they had not felt a supportive culture there. Those who are among the few who are different than the majority often face much more difficult cultures to work within. When I interviewed women at Utah State University, women faculty, to find out what their experiences were, I found those that were among the few in their colleges or their departments had a much more difficult time than those where there were fields where there were lots of women. And science and engineering had particularly low numbers of women. I interviewed one woman faculty member about her experiences. She was one of just a few women in her college, and this is what she said. I, felt, I have felt very isolated in this college, and not because people mean to isolate me, but there are all these different relationships or clubs going on. And sometimes you don't make it in for no apparent reason. She'd felt isolated her entire career. Some research suggests that the percentage of women in a given organization or department needs to reach about 20 to 25 percent before it creates kind of a tipping point in which women are no longer viewed as a representative of their, of their gender and cultures start to change in ways that make it feel more hospitable. A few years ago, a woman was denied tenure at a university in another state. Despite having good qualifications, her department chair had written in her file, this woman has two young children, which is incompatible with an academic career. She received a $400,000 settlement from her university. <laughs> the, this kind of overt bias is rare today. What the bigger problem is, is implicit bias. And implicit bias are biases that we're not fully aware of. And this is website implicit.harvard.edu. It's part of a large study that Harvard's doing on implicit bias. And they allow anyone to go in and take the test and get their own score. They just want you to fill in some of your age and gender information so they can use it in their research. And they have 14 different ways that you can measure what your level of implicit bias is. Uh, gender, age, weight, skin color, a number of different categories. So I encourage you to try it and see where you are. N implicit biases have a real downside to them. First, because we're not aware we have them, and second, because they negatively affect our hiring and promotion decisions. Because 
we are we are biased and we don't realize it, and we're not choosing the highest quality when the biases are taking place. There are two gender schemas that particularly adversely affect, create, create obstacles for women. The first has to do with perceived ability, and the second with a perceived <coughs> violation of behavioral norms. Women are not behaving the way they're supposed to behave. So the first is an incompetent schema. And what, where we found, and both of these are very, very strongly supported by research. The, and what we find in the incompetent schema is that in studies with identical resumes or identical CVs, you put a male name on the top of one and a female name on the top of the other. And then these have been distributed to hundreds and hundreds of people in different studies, college students, community members, business people. In every case, if the profession listed is, has historically been male, could be police officer, could be lawyer, could be professor, if then when these resumes are evaluated in terms of their qualifications, the one with the male name is consistently evaluated as more qualified, despite identical resumes being used. The next schema is a deferentially challenged schema, and this has to do with women not behaving as well as they should or as appropriately as they should. Women who do succeed in a male-dominated field pay a success penalty. Because they're different, because they have succeeded, they are judged as being somehow deficit in social sensitivity or nurturing. And my research also shows an anger penalty, that when women express anger, they're judged more harshly than are men. And there was a very interesting study that was just published last year where men and women were videotaped, or sorry, a male and a female actor were videotaped, acting out the exact same scenario. In one case, the man and the woman each acted out the scenario expressing anger. In the next case, they each acted out the same scenario with no expression of anger. Then again, hundreds of people were asked to evaluate these, these videotapes, college students, community people. And in each case of the four scenarios, the man who expressed anger was given higher status than any of the, rated as having higher status than any of the other categories, regardless of whether they were told he was a CEO or he was an assistant of some kind. The woman who expressed anger was evaluated as having the lowest status of any of the four videotapes, and regardless of what title she was given, and worth being paid less money than any of the other videotapes. So I actually have two political cartoons from the recent election to illustrate these two schemas. The first is Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin did not reach the competence bar in the media. The second is Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Hillary Clinton clearly reached the competence bar, but she did not cross the de uh, she didn't meet the deferentially challenged standard. She was too deferentially challenged and judged harshly because of that. A New York Times article that came out before this cartoon said, they cast Hillary Clinton as an angry woman. This handcuffs Hillary. If she doesn't speak out strongly against President Bush, she's timid and girly. If she does, she's a witch and a shrew. It's a narrow balance beam to try and traverse between these two extremes. How do you become competent enough without crossing the bar and being judged harshly for being deferentially challenged? It, it's a difficult process. And so, as we identified these obstacles and could see clearly what they were, we began trying to address how do we remove the obstacles to allow greater success. So the first obstacle we tried to overcome was that this ideal worker model that said you have to work long hours in order to be successful by trying to put in place policies that would allow flexibility in careers. And let me give you a few examples here. At Utah State, we've used multiple programs and policy changes to try and create alternatives. One of the first, and it's been in place for quite a while, is a part-time option for tenure-track faculty. 
So they could work 80%, 75%, or 50% time, still have the option of getting tenure. This has not been used by ver very many people. Several women have got successfully gotten tenure on this path. But there's quite a bit of nervousness about whether you can actually get tenure on a part-time track. So it's, the usage is, is modest. Much more commonly is an extended time to tenure. A tenure clock is normally six years, and an up or out decision is made, whether you either get your job, keep your job because you're good enough, or you don't, you're told to go find someplace else where you, there might be a better fit. So we've written into code in the policy that you can ask for a tenure clock extension for a variety of circumstances, including the birth or adoption of a child and other family situations. We, and this has been used quite extensively. Last year, more men than women used this tenure clock extension. Next, we have child care, critical part of creating flexibility for families. We currently have on-site child care center under construction. We're thrilled 20 years in the studying and planning and trying to find financing. And thanks to the heroic efforts of President Stan and his wife, Joyce Albrecht, it's finally under construction. <laughs> and we're very excited. We also have an option that's a referral service for in-home care that's run out of the Vice Provost offices. And Vice Provost Ann Austin is running this. Many parents prefer, and some children do better in a home setting. And we have lots of uh, homes in Cache Valley where they're women willing to provide child care. So the Vice Provost Office screens those and provides referrals. And then finally, we have a parental caregiving policy in progress, not in place. The financial crisis is uh, slowing this down a little. But what this will allow is it will allow faculty who give birth or adopt a child to have a reduction in teaching for a semester so that they can spend time with the child but also maintain their research, which is most critical to getting tenure and getting promotion. So this is in progress and we hope to fully implement it sometime soon. Next, as we work to remove obstacles, we want to recognize that policies are not enough. Policies have to be able to be used without negative stigma. And many professional firms, you can ask, and yes, they have the policy in place, but nobody knows about them, nobody uses them because they're afraid it'll kill their, kill their career. So what we're doing is trying to track the usage of these policies. And University of Washington recently completed a study of the tenure process, at, the tenure extension process at their university. And they found that using a tenure clock extension once had no adverse effect on tenure. But using it twice did have a significant negative impact. So Utah State is tracking our own data to try and find out what the pattern is. And the thought, we can't tell for sure if, if that second usage would be bias in the system or if it would be that people who are in trouble use a second extension to try and give themselves some more time for tenure. And we don't have that data yet. Next, we publicize comparative data internally to try and provide a sort of report card to let colleges know how they're doing in their hiring and promotion. And we do this by comparing our data to national data. And it was very interesting when we we've, we've presented this data on an annual basis for the last five years. And once we started presenting the data, we saw the numbers of women being hired and promoted both increase as people started becoming aware that there were deficits in some, some fields. So over the last five years that this, we've been working on this, we've, this is a total of the averages. And we can see that in two of our science and engineering colleges, <coughs> they've actually exceeded availability. In engineering, only 18% of the PhDs in engineering go to women. So they're the lowest field of all the disciplines. But our college hired 21% women over the last five years. We said, that's great. We're happy. In agriculture, 32% of the women in the country, 32% of the PhDs go to women. Our college hired 37%. Again, be better than we could hope for. 
natural resources and science, both were a little bit lower than the availability. But they're getting the information and, and seeing how they're doing. So this process of finding national data and making it available has had a significant, it appears to have had a significant impact. Next, we use procedures to try and counter the implicit bias. So what do we do, since people aren't aware that they even have it, what we try and do is to use multiple raters. So Utah State always uses search committees of at least five people to evaluate resumes and candidates. And then we try, and we've worked very hard to train these search committees to focus on objective criteria. So that when a job search begins, the search committee immediately starts listing what those criteria are going to be, how they're going to evaluate the candidate. Then they take the, then they use those to write the job ad. And then they typically, and the engineers are the best at this, create a spreadsheet with all the criteria across the top and a list of all the resumes, the names on all the CVs that have come in down the bottom, and then put an evaluation number next to each of the categories. And that way, it can take some of the... Uh, subjectivity out of the process, not all of it, but some, and then you bring the committee back together, everyone with their spreadsheets, say, okay, who do we think is the best? And some people see different things on the resumes and on the CVs, and so there has to be some discussion of what is the most valuable, how are you counting that, how do you see it differently? Again, to try and get more eyes looking at it, to talk about and be able to, to explain rationale and move away from the implicit bias. The one thing we try to do is to avoid the philosophy of, I know quality when I see it. This is fraught with potential bias. Why? Because quality often looks like ourselves. <laughs> Without specific objective criteria, quality can look like it's always looked in the past. It's harder to see quality in someone who looks different than the person that's filled the position before. Another way that we do this is, and Utah State has not fully implemented this one, but there's research to support it, and that is to remove the names when rating resumes and vetas, just like I talked about, the identical vetas and resume studies, just the name can create some bias. We, and we see this in symphony orchestras. In the 1970s, women only made up 10% of the musicians in symphony orchestras. Until orchestras starting using screens that musicians would audition behind so the judges couldn't see them. As that was implemented, the percentage of women in symphony orchestras jumped to 35% in just a few years. In the book Blink by Malcolm Gladwell, he tells the story of Julie Landsman's audition as a principal fresh French horn player for the Met. At that time, there had never been a, brass sec a woman in the brass section of the symphony. Everyone knew that women couldn't play horns as well. They weren't as large, they didn't have as large of lung capacity, and so women played violins and other stringed instruments. So Julie Landsman auditioned behind the screen. It was the first time the Met had ever used a screen. She knew she had the part before she finished, she, because she held the high C extra long and heard the judges laugh, because everyone knew she'd gone over and above what was necessary to convince them. And then, when she stepped out from behind the screen, the judges gasped. <laughs> Not because she was a woman, but because they knew her. She'd substituted at the Met on several occasions. But it wasn't until they heard her with only their ears that they recognized how good she was. So as women have moved into these fields by providing training on objective criteria when hiring, highlighting the data, and providing more information about the requirements for promotion, Utah State has been able to recognize quality better. And what we've seen, this is our promotion chart, 
to the highest level of full professor. Utah State got a late start in science and engineering. Our first two promotions to full professor occurred in 1988 and moved very slowly along for the next 15 or so years. And then after the advanced program began, we've seen a nice increase in the tra trajectory of the promotions as some of these processes have been implemented. We've also seen significant improvement in the hiring rate. We started at 23 percent women assistant professors in all of science and engineering. We're now at 34 percent, which is very close to national average. So our hiring has done particularly well. And even though I sh but even though I showed you that nice, neat increase in promotions, we're at 8 percent, which is significantly below the national average. So we still need the next decade or so to, to try and get that number up close to national average. But because we're hiring well, it's likely that we may be able to have that happen. So next, I recommend listening to those who are different. Often those who are different than the majority experience the organization in a different way. And as I've worked on this project and interviewed women in science and engineering, it's given me the information to know how it is they're experiencing and what kinds of policy changes and what we can do to try and create a better university. Finally, keep working to change hearts and minds. This is a slow process. Changing policies is the beginning, but it's changing the hearts of those that you're working with. It's a slow process, but when people recognize what the issues are and begin becoming aware, that's when long-lasting, long-term change happens. By implementing these policies at Utah State University, we've been able to create significant improvements in the retention rate of, of rates of women faculty in the sciences. When we started, women left at an annual rate of 8%, whereas men only left at an annual rate of 3% that indicated significant problems among the women in their senses of isolation, lack of appreciation, lack of support. There will always be some turnover. Some people don't get tenure, some people get better jobs and move on. But what we've done over the last five years is bring those turnover rates down so that they're almost equal, both in the 3% level, and that's what we want. We want comparable levels of turnover. We can't eliminate turnover completely. So in conclusion, Utah State and society benefit immeasurably when all persons, regardless of race or gender, have the opportunity to earn respect and advancement based on ability. Thank you. Okay. We now have time for questions. Yes. I, I thought a problem with women moving into higher levels of science and engineering was perhaps the social stigma in junior high and high school that, that girls don't do math. But you didn't mention that. Is, is that a factor that you're aware of? Yes, and there's actually, there's actually a different grant that's focused on that. There's a large engineering education grant that has seven or eight universities, including Utah State involved, where they're looking at K through 12. And how do we keep women in math so that they have options to choose whatever discipline they want? So w we started at PhD. So we've got women at the PhD level coming out. 45% of the women are getting. 45% uh, of the PhDs are going to women. So we're saying, okay, that's good enough for us right now. <laughs> what can we do to keep them in the field? And so that's been our focus. Good question. Yes. Does your project work with other private or public institutions in Utah? Um, we have not worked within Utah. We've uh, annually met with the other institutions that are working, on, other universities that are working on this project to share information. But we haven't, this has been such an intensive project just focusing on Utah State that we have not worked much with, with other institutions within Utah. University of Utah a bit. Yes. Uh, I think it's Professor Colby from Simmons College who first noted that uh, uh, implicit bias and deferential bias begins to break down when uh, fathers of professional women begin to see the biases that their daughters are encountering in the workforce. Have you seen any evidence of that or uh, could you, um, from your readings, corroborate that? 
Yes, there, there haven't been very many studies, but there does seem to be some evidence that men are more likely to become attuned to those challenges when their, their daughters are facing them. And that because those men are often in powerful positions, it creates a, a tremendous opportunity to make change. Yes? Uh, I'm Ruth Novak. I graduated from Utah State in 1958 with a bachelor's degree, 1960 with a master's in math. Uh, I have to say Utah State has come a long way. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in college, I wanted to major in engineering, but that wasn't possible because at that time, engineers had to spend the summer at summer camp, and they didn't have any facilities for women. <laughs> so I took the next best step and majored in mathematics. But the other thing I wanted to comment on is, he said in 19, 1970s when women really started, and that was a result of affirmative action. And people talk about affirmative action, but my experience was women benefited the most from the affirmative action programs. And that brought, did bring a lot of women into non-traditional fields. So, so that was, and, and when I was working, at, I got a job with a company called Hercules. <laughs> a powder company, and they were just forming a company here in Utah. So they didn't have an established hierarchy. So uh, a woman coming into that company didn't really have to fight <laughs> the established male hierarchy. But the thing that I found when I, we were, in, we had to implement an affirmative action program because our programs were government funded. And one of the big benefits was the sensitivity analysis, or sensitivity sessions that were, uh, everyone had to go to to really create an understanding of their biases and why they were biased and why these biases weren't really. And, and uh, I thought that was really an exceptional program to change. I even found that I had stereotypical male biases. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I really liked your Presentation. Thank you. Just to comment, the data does show both men and women have biases, as do minorities, of thinking that minorities and women are less competent, that we've absorbed what's in the culture. So I encourage all of you to check to see where your biases are. But I also appreciate your comments. The women who went first in the 50s and earlier were really groundbreakers and often paid a heavy price for, for their being first and being early in this process. Yes, at the back. Um, I can also attest to um, women in natural resources. I was in the early 80s, and there were like one or two of us, and some of the difficulties, for example, would be out on the field trip in the West Desert and a pit stop when you're the only woman in the band. <laughs> um, but, uh, I have a question. What has been the response? Are you tracking the response of men to some of these efforts? In prior days, of course, they only had to, if you will, compete with 50% of the human race for their jobs and their uh, promotions and you know there is a real issue and some has been with affirmative action with reverse discrimination I think that um, both men and women are, are past that a little bit but nevertheless um, it requires the active um, embracing and feeling like there are advantages to men for these changes and so I think it would be important if we're not to track their attitudes and desires and uh, priorities and try to incorporate those into the policies to make a better workplace for everybody. And I might follow up that I have a son and his wife, both of whom are professionals, and I see a great, they struggle with the child thing, of course, but I see a great deal more tolerance and egalitarianism among the generation that are now in their 30s trying to be dual professional couples than even 10 years, uh, you know, those that are in their 40s or 50s or 60s, which I consider uh, a very positive change, but it's also still a struggle raising families and being professional. Yeah, let me add to that. One part of our data showed that when I first did the study, a survey of, of faculty at Utah State, the two groups that reported the most work-family conflict were tenured women and untenured men. And I believe that what the untenured men were saying is we've got professional spouses, 
And the one with the f more flexible career, we still work long hours, but we have more flexibility in those hours, tends to take on more of the child care responsibility. So we definitely are seeing some transition in that as men are married to professional wives. The, we don't have a lot of evidence on their, uh, the extent of biases because, especially at universities, we have faculty believing that they are unbiased and they're not overtly biased. So it becomes more difficult when you get to the implicit level. And so we, it's hard to capture bias at this point in time because people can't admit to it because they don't know they have it. And so we, we've gone to a different level of analysis trying to create those shifts. I don't want to cut off the discussion. Uh, I think Dr. Calster be here with I us will. for a few minutes to answer your questions uh, privately. But we want to break now to let those of you who need to get somewhere else get there. Thank you all very much for coming today. Thank you, Dr. Calster. And the, uh, uh, our large crowd, I think, uh, demonstrates the interest that many of you have in Dr. Callister's research. I'm pleased to announce that starting with the last Sunrise session and including this one today, these presentations are going to be available to you streamed on the Vice President for Research's website, which means that if you've got a colleague who wasn't able to be here today, this makes it easy for you to save and forward this presentation on to them or just to refer back to it yourself to share with other people. Uh, in that same spirit, I want to announce, just to give you a heads up, those of you who have been with us for a while, we're going to try an experiment uh, in our next session of using only email and electronic forms of communication to announce this event rather than the mailed invitations. If you want a mailed one, you let us know. We'll make sure that we get you one, but we're going to try to do our part for the environment. and. Uh, uh, simplify things a little bit by going with electronic communication. We can use your help in that regard by passing that email on to other colleagues who might be interested in that when you get it. Uh, our, next, uh, our next event is presented to you here on a Save the Date card. We continue to try to do these events in Salt Lake City to make it available for you, a little connection to us in Logan. But I also want to point out that if you happen to be in Logan, we've got a couple of other major events coming up over the, the rest of the spring, and we'd like to extend our invitation to you for those. Uh, our graduation will be uh, next Saturday, and so uh, we'd love to have any of you join us for kind of the culmination of what we do at Utah State to see our, our new graduates. Uh, also, uh, Memorial Day of this year, we're having a special concert and benefit, a benefit concert and dinner uh, that our department head in music, Craig Jessup, has put together with Donny Osmond. So if you're interested in that, uh, that information is available on the USU website. We can get you some tickets for that. Uh, with that, I want to thank again Jennifer and her colleagues at Regents for sponsoring these events. You make it possible for us to make this presentation, so we're grateful. Thank you all for coming.